Welcome to the California Initiative for Health Equity in Action uh, briefing on housing as a health intervention. We're very pleased to have a very uh, exemplary uh, panel of experts covering a wide range of areas in the housing and health space. Um, the California Initiative for Health Equity in, Ac in Action is a research translation center that tries to disseminate faculty research into the legislature and into state health and human services agencies to support health equity policies and interventions in the state and seeing evidence uh, really uh, show up into action in our policies and programs. And so today our, our briefing is focused on housing as a health intervention. We're really focused on addressing the gamut of uh, interventions in the housing and health space. Uh, we have presenters Norwita Milburn, who's a professor at UCLA, uh, who studies psychosocial interventions for adolescents in order to reunite them with their families, because a major reason for homelessness among adolescents is family conflict. And some of these psychosocial interventions are really ripe for uh, testing and dissemination, and she'll talk about those. We then have Ben Henwood, a professor at U.S. University of Southern California, who's going to talk to us about housing first models and some of his work, related work on interventions uh, in housing. Then we're going to have uh, Professor Andy Potter, who's from California State University, Chico, who just had a published study looking at what healthcare systems and hospitals are doing in order to address housing and what kinds of community uh, partnerships are they developing and what are they doing internally in, inside their walls to address this issue. And then um, we're going to end with Cynthia uh, Nagendra, who is the new executive director of the UCSF uh, Benioff Housing and Health Institute. But before we do that, we have an, a very uh, exciting guest speaker to join us, uh, Assembly Member David Chu, who um, is central to the uh, Assembly's housing and community development efforts. He actually chairs the, that committee. And we're so fortunate to have him with us today to be able to, uh, to, to tell us about his efforts. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I wish we were all meeting in person in Sacramento. Uh, I want to welcome you from the state capital in Sacramento. Uh, we, uh, we are in different circumstances than we had expected when uh, this uh, initiative was pulled in place. And I'm the organizers uh, for what you're doing and and just thank all of you for your work and your focus in promoting and identifying evidence-based approaches to addressing homelessness so um before the events of the last couple of weeks uh, i was prepared to talk about the crisis of the day which is homelessness the moral crisis uh, not just facing california but facing our entire country in the worst housing crisis in our history and I know uh, many of you who are joining us are experts in those fields, and I really appreciate the work you're doing to advise us as policymakers and what to do. Um, that being said, obviously, the crisis of the day of a couple weeks ago has now been compounded by the second crisis of the day, which is coronavirus. And I just want to take a moment and, and, and both acknowledge that, the fact that, as the New York Times said, literally today we have 550,000 individuals in America that medical researchers uh, have pointed to who have a double vulnerability because of coronavirus and the fact that they're homeless. But I think it's really indicative of the fact uh, and the importance of the work that you're doing, the intersection between health and housing um, and thinking about uh, the intersectionality between those issues, how we can address homelessness, uh, through better interventions on the healthcare side, and in particular, vice versa. That is why we're all here today. Um, I first came to the subject matter of, uh, of, of the panels uh, that we're going to be discussing today about three years ago when I was asked to sponsor a bill uh, referred to as the Housing for a Healthy California Bill. And what we were trying to address is the fact that we know that if you are a chronically homeless individual, who is a Medi-Cal recipient in the state of California, it typically costs our state $60,000 a year to address your healthcare needs in part because you are cycling in and out of emergency rooms, jail mental health services, other tertiary emergency room type care that's very expensive. 
and we have had a, uh, a working hypothesis that has been confirmed by some data around the country uh, that if we put a supportive roof, a supportive housing roof over your head, uh, and we think about a housing first model, uh, that is not only the more humane way to address your needs, but it is also a much more cost-effective and policy-effective way of doing that. Um, so this is a pilot program that will essentially track costs for individuals when they're homeless, comparing that to what happens when they're housed in a supportive housing services. Uh, and, uh, and I know this is not a new idea for folks in, in, in your community. Um, and yet, it's not been easy to convince individuals. You know what, for, for I think all the folks who are participating today, this is not a new idea. For much of the healthcare world, um, it has been a challenge to convince the community to use healthcare dollars to pay for housing costs. As our government get louder. Uh, it is his belief that doctors solutions uh, and, uh, and and these are the sort of, uh, evidence-based approaches that we want to bring to the conversation. Um, let me just talk for a moment about a couple of subject areas that we are focused on at the state of California level to address homelessness and how this impacts the intersection between health and housing. You know, first and foremost, um, we want to take a very evidence-based and data-based approach to shaping homelessness policy, and uh, there are a couple of uh, items that are moving through the legislature this year and through the state capitol to, to result in that. Uh, first is a bill that I have introduced to call for a statewide needs and gaps analysis. So the idea is to ask every city and county in the state to provide to Sacramento an accounting of what current funding and programs they have at this moment for homelessness and then uh, what is the gap between what they have as far as resources and what they need to have to end homelessness or significantly reduce homelessness. We've never been able to gather this data before in California. It's our hope that we'll be able to do that and, and obviously start to put the picture together of what we're doing versus what we need. Um, and and uh, that would help us figure out what we need to invest in steps forward. Related to that, um, the Governor Newsom recently outlined uh, his plans for a statewide homelessness data warehouse. And this is something that uh, was embodied in a bill that I had in the last few years uh, to really allow the state to have granular data, again, to understand what's happening at the local level, in cities and counties, where are people uh, homeless, and how can we better direct state and local resources. So that is sort of an initial level setting data and evidence gathering uh, work that hopefully <laughs> Um, when I'm asked what is the state's role around homelessness, I often say there are three major, um, three major arenas for us to, to engage in. First is to figure out how to streamline the delivery of funding and services, not just from the state, but throughout the state of California. Uh, I just did a hearing literally a few hours ago in my Assembly Housing Committee involving a bill where we talked about the fact that there are 13 state agencies that oversee at least 30 different programs that intersect communities who are homeless. And part of what we need to do is to do a better job of streamlining, of integrating, but also breaking down critical silos between policy areas the healthcare system and the housing system being two uh, of the most important systems we need to break down. But in addition, thinking about how the criminal justice system, the education system, the foster care system, the social service system, touch and impact individuals who are homeless who are also impacting our healthcare system. So um, how do we better streamline? How do we better break down these silos? How do we identify individuals that are leaving a variety of institutions, whether it be a hospital, a healthcare facility, a, uh, a criminal justice facility, et cetera, and connect them to housing. Uh, related to this, how do we think about the new Medi-Cal CalAIM program as a truly whole person care system so that housing is fully integrated in healthcare? So, so part of our exercise in Sacramento is just how do we facilitate the broader streamlining of homelessness? A second thing we need to do, and just as important, is we've got to have a conversation about the appropriate level of funding. Um, we have, in the last couple of years, uh, made one-time homeless funding decisions 
Two years ago, it was about a half a billion dollars. Last year, it was $650 million. This year, Governor Newsom has proposed $750 million. I think many of us in the legislature think that we need to have at least a conversation in the billions of dollars. What is the right size of our investment? And then how do we actually fund it? Uh, we know we're not gonna be able to rely on budget surpluses much longer, particularly with the coronavirus and the impact on our economy. How do we provide local jurisdictions and the entire state with the certainty that we are providing this, the right magnitude of a response when it comes to resources? And then the third um, area that I expect a lot of conversation in Sacramento is, what does accountability look like? If we are going to be delivering billions of dollars to local governments, to nonprofit organizations, to healthcare institutions, to address homelessness, how do we ensure that we are all holding ourselves and everyone else accountable? Um, I think the public has been asking the questions in recent years about the reality that billions of dollars appear to be flowing to, um, to cities throughout California, but uh, the public continues also to see double digit increases in point in time counts uh, every time we do it. So how do we ensure that the monies that we're spending are, best, are put to best use? And how do we ensure that as we break down silos between say the healthcare system and our housing and homelessness infrastructure, that we're doing this in a way that again is humane and cost efficient. So, uh, so with that, I wanted to just sketch this out. Uh, my hope is folks much smarter than me are about to share some of their perspectives and uh, my staff and I will be eagerly listening to, uh, to their perspectives and yours and uh, very much hope that out of uh, today's gathering online uh, that you will help us really understand what policymakers can do to address the most intense uh, the most intense crises that we are facing right now as a state. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Assembly Member Chu, for those remarks. Uh, our first presenter is Norwita Milburn from UCLA, um, who is now going to talk about uh, homelessness among adolescents. We'll be uh, having after each presentation a short uh, question and answer period for clarifying questions. Then our presenter, uh, Eli uh, from UC Berkeley is going to uh, facilitate a broader set of questions at the end. So I'm going to turn the presentation over to Norwita now for her presentation. So I wanna say good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to focus on youth experiencing homelessness so I will start with a quick overview of their prevalence and characteristics, and then I'll talk about the efficacy of interventions to address some of their health problems. I will then focus on family reunification as an intervention strategy for homeless youth using an evidence-based approach called support to reunite, involve, and value each other or strive. In my presentation, family is broadly defined to include birth parents, foster parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, um, as well as other caring adults in a young person's life. And I'm going to conclude with suggestions for policy and future funding strategies to address youth homelessness. So that's just my disclaimer, uh, the support that I receive um, I'm in the Department of Psychiatry at UCLA. Most of the research that I have done has been funded through the National Institutes of Health and various institutes there. Um, in terms of the prevalence of youth homelessness, it's really challenging to get an accurate counting of the number of homeless youth that we have, whether we're talking about the United States, California, or Los Angeles County. And this is because factors such as how homelessness is defined, the age ranges that encompass being a young person, and how the counting is done all can have an effect on the numbers that we see. So I'm going to start with uh, the US. So recent rigorous research using a national sample of adult households with a young person in the household provides national estimates for the prevalence of homeless youth. And this is defined as youth who had run away from home, been asked to leave home, or were couch surfing at least one day in the past year. So this is not numbers actually on the streets, but an estimate over, um, 
um, almost kind of a lifetime experience of homelessness. So for youth ages 13 to 17, the number is about 660,000 nationally. And for youth ages 18 to 25 years, the estimate was about 2,400,000 youth nationally. So this is an estimate for the number of young people who have experienced homelessness in their lifetimes. Um, when we look at prevalence for California, that's really not well known. So one suggestion is that the number of youth under 18 or minor youth is about 200,000. For Los Angeles County, um, looking at the point in time count, for young people under 18, it's about 603. This is 2019 point in time or the pit count and uh, 3,323 ages 18 to 24 years. So if we go back to the national data, um, when we look at characteristics or risk for homelessness, and this is based on logistical regressions and uh, risk ratios, being a parent, African-American, LGBT, or having less than a high school education are risk for homelessness among youth. For California, if we just kind of look at the characteristics of homeless youth, youth on the street are more likely or often older and male. Youth who are sheltered are younger and female. Again, we see an overrepresentation of LGBT youth. And again, parenting, um, we see youth are parenting. Just for LA County, um, the Homeless youth we see here are primarily male. They're mostly African-American and Hispanic or Latino. Again, um, we do see a number of LGBT youth. And when we look at um, some illnesses that we see, we see substance use disorder and um, serious mental illness. So when we talk about interventions for homeless youth, we find that, um, again, with rigorous um, a rigorous approach to understanding um, interventions, doing a syst systematic review. We know that housing programs are effective in increasing housing stability. We're talking about models like Housing First. Cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, is effective in reducing depression. And family-based therapy is effective in reducing substance um, use. So why is family important? Why do we focus on family and the work that we do? Um, why consider families for youth who are often defined as unaccompanied and not with their families? So as I just noted, family therapy can be effective for addressing some health issues among homeless youth. We also know that young people who have good communication with and are bonded with a caring adult have better trajectories into adulthood and they're less likely to engage in risky behaviors that can affect their health, such as using drugs, having unprotected sex, and engaging in externalizing behaviors. We also know from research that youth who um, have family connections are more likely to return to stable housing and remain stably housed. So this is not a political statement this slide, but I do use it to illustrate that family conflict happens in all families. If you look at the faces of the Obamas in this picture, no one is happy. So this is like the best of families, a family that's highly resourced and well supported. I'm sure Barack Obama's thinking, oh my gosh, you just got off of Air Force One. We had a great trip. But there's clearly some conflict going on in this family. So homeless youth in both shelters and residential programs have reported that family dynamics are critical issues in leading to their homelessness. So we know that um, family conflict can lead to youth becoming homeless. So we also know that building positive connections for youth is essential to, using, to ending youth homelessness and family interventions are one way to do this. Um, another recent study said that um, family members can be important sources of support and play a significant role in helping youth to regain a positive state of functioning after a bout of homelessness. 
Um, researchers have also confirmed that even if a youth is not reunified with his or her family, families will most often remain in youth's lives far longer than service providers, and youth generally feel a connection to families and maintain some level of contact, even when we see conflict in the families. So this slide just illustrates that family-based interventions are still a relatively unexplored area, and evidence-based ones are rare by evidence-based. I mean, they've been tested with a, com a comparison or control group in an experimental or quasi-experimental design. STRIVE is one of three evidence-based family interventions for homeless youth. The other two are ecological-based family therapy and functional family therapy. So just a quick snap snapshot of this intervention. So STRIVE teaches youth to argue with family or caring adults and not leave home. It's evidence-based, it's practical, easy to apply, and can be customized to the local culture. The approach is client-centered and strength-based. Skills are responsible for the effectiveness of the introduction of the intervention and those skills are introduced, modeled, and rehearsed. So how do we reduce co family conflict in this intervention? We help youth and family or caring adults gain a better understanding and awareness of why they feel, think, or behave the way they do. So it is a CBT model. We provide them with some strategic coping skills to help them better manage through situations and problems. Um, we teach things like emotional regulation, problem solving. So why do we do what we do? So research has shown that healthy family relationships, goal setting, decision making, and self-reliant coping are protective factors for youth. And the goal of STRIVE is really to change the trajectory of risk for youth by focusing on building positive connections between youth or a caring adult. So we have um, been working on trying to scale up this intervention, not in California, but in Connecticut, in part in Connecticut because the service sector is less siloed. So we've been uh, developing a proposal to test a statewide implementation of STRIVE. We've been working with the Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness, and the coalition has been piloting the implementation of STRIVE statewide. Connecticut has approximately, it's much smaller number of homeless youth, 4,396 youth who are homeless or unstably housed, 74% are transition age youth. So we've been working with the coalition to begin to see how to scale up the intervention. We've provided training and technical assistance through the delivery of the intervention. We are only collecting quality improvement data at this point. So we've been working with the state's eight youth engagement team initiatives. We've trained providers across the state's eight coordinated access networks. And STRIVE is being used as part of a diversion for youth coordinated entry and as an additional tool for shelter staff. And in addition in Connecticut, the coalition has been partnering with all the systems that impact youth homelessness, such as child welfare, juvenile justice, and schools. So when we think about um, the healthy trajectory from adolescence to adulthood, um, we know that there are effective interventions for addressing some of the um, health issues that homeless youth have. But we also feel that there's a need for um, interventions that target education and employment. So we're saying that upstream prevention is really important to address homelessness among youth. And one of the things that I did not point out is that our homeless youth, youth who are homeless today and who remain homeless can become part of the chronic homeless population that we are dealing with. So it's really important to intervene early on. We um, need to continue to focus on housing and family connections or connections to caring adults, as well as education and employment in our efforts. Education and employment are so important for young people to um, become self-sufficient um, adults. There are interventions that target employment, for example. One area of research that's being done by um, researcher uh, Karen Ferguson and her colleagues is a work intervention for serious mentally ill homeless youth. 
that uses a social enterprise approach, and her findings suggest homeless adolescents, mental health, and housing stability can be improved with this intervention. And this slide just really provides an overview showing that for young people, work is very important, as well as some of the um, challenges that young people experience working. I just want to conclude by um, emphasizing that um, funding is always an issue for both research and programs or practice. And some funding strategies that could be beneficial to you uh, addressing youth homelessness in California. And we heard from um, Representative Chu about, for example, having a data warehouse. So funding to support applied rapid research, um, funding that could really help build collaborations between providers and researchers for quality improvement and accountability, implementation research that really targets the scalability and dissemination of evidence-based interventions, and last would be mechanisms that can help researchers translate findings into practice and policy implications. I've used WE throughout this presentation. These are the colleagues that I've worked closely with. They've contributed to these slides, um, both colleagues at UCLA and in Connecticut. And I want to end by saying thank you. We're going to hold off on questions until the end, uh, and we're going to move on to uh, Professor Ben Henwood from USC is going to talk about housing first. So, Ben, um, you're on. Uh, thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Norita. Th that actually, we're now going to switch a little bit to, I guess we're taking a life course perspective here and focusing now more on uh, older adults. And I, I wanted to just um, discuss with you a, a study that we conducted that, that is funded through the National Institute on Aging that's looking at, um, looking at a population in permanent supportive housing and, um, and the implications of the study in terms of uh, aging services that are needed in particular fall prevention um, that, that is a, a need in uh, PSH. Um, and so I just wanted to start by saying, you know, that th this idea of housing as a health intervention it is something that um, I I've, th I've been thinking about for a while. And in, in 2013, uh, we published an article that, that was really more of a thought piece thinking through, well, what, what are the mechanisms that could improve the health of, of the people um, in permanent supportive housing, because we know that there's a good evidence base that it, it can effectively end homelessness, but, but exactly what are those mechanisms that would improve the health of, of the tenants? And just real quickly, the, the three that we outlined, of course, are um, actual health care and health interventions that could be delivered within a supportive housing context. But, but then the housing itself, and, and actually, you know, most of the literature that looks at housing talks about how poor housing conditions lead to worse health outcomes. There isn't a lot that's been done on how housing actually can improve health. And, and in fact, the um, National Academy of Sciences came out with a, 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 um, a white paper last year that tried to look at the impact of permanent, permanent supportive housing um, on health outcomes. And, and one of the big takeaways that the front, for me from that report was this idea, or what are some um, housing sensitive conditions that we might expect would improve uh, when people can actually access housing? The, the final <clears throat> thing we explored in the paper was just actually thinking about neighborhood and built environments are really from like a public uh, health and urban planning perspective, we know that access to things like safe neighborhoods and parks can improve, you know, people's uh, ability to exercise and walkability and, and those sorts of issues. So what are some, some of those built environment characteristics that, that we might see in permanent supportive housing that would lead to better health? And the last one that really we, I, we didn't look at, but also just we know that um, social networks are important and they impact people's health behaviors. So when someone transitions from homelessness into permanent supportive housing, 
what happens to their social net networks and what sort of impact might that have on a person's health. So anyway, I just wanted to start kind of by, by in some ways, the work we're doing now, this was to set out kind of a, a research agenda at the time. And so we have, we have been exploring a lot of these different issues uh, in the past seven years or so since that came out. What I wanted to talk about today, though, more specifically, again, was um, looking at uh, more the support services and interventions that could be implemented uh, within permanent supportive housing using a housing first context. And I just wanted to, I'm not going to go into what housing first is. I think a lot of people have a sense of what it is, um, but, but just a few quick points. One. Um, is that we do know that it has a pretty robust evidence base that it can effectively end homelessness. Um, and, I, and I say that only because we do see now moves, especially on the federal level, to move away from an evidence-based um, uh, policy making on this issue. So, so I just wanted to kind of um, reiterate that, that, that it, it does have that kind of robust uh, research support. And, and I think the second thing that doesn't get talked enough about, but I think it's relevant for today, is that fundamentally Housing First came about and is, should be driven by a person-centered philosophy. And so this idea that Housing First works in part because it matches what people want, need, and are asking for, specifically access to housing, uh, with that resource, that's why we, we see it working. So I won't go too much more into housing first, but what I, what I did want to point out is that when the model was developed um, in, the, in the early 90s, um, well, well, let me just back up and tell you what you're looking at. So, so this actually is a, a slide that um, our colleague uh, Dennis Colhane put together looking at the age distribution of those who are um, chronically homeless. Um, and you can see, so the green line, what you're looking at is that age distribution in the 1990s or 1990 and in, uh, the red is from 2000 and the blue is 2010. And essentially, uh, what this points out is that we have seen a, a shift in the average age of the chronically homeless population, suggesting that they are a cohort that's been out on the streets for quite some time. And that in the 90s, when Housing First was developed, really the, the, you know, the, the average age was in their mid-30s, right? And so the services um, that were put in place were primarily uh, focused on uh, behavioral health issues uh, because that was the most significant issue. But as we've, over the past several decades, uh, you know, when, the, when the research started coming out in the early 2000s about the effectiveness of this approach, and now at the point today where it is uh, federal policy to, to be uh, using PSH and housing first, we really have a, the target age is, you know, approaching their um, mid to late 50s. And, and we know also from the work of some of our, our colleagues, including Margot Cushell, uh, and Rebecca Brown, that this, this is a population that experiences accelerated, accelerated aging, uh, so that even though they're only in their mid to late 50s, which doesn't maybe sound particularly old, uh, their bodies present uh, as much older, right? Uh, so the, the toll of being homeless for all those years, you can see that in uh, early onset of many chronic conditions and ger geriatric conditions. The point about all this is that we haven't necessarily continued our conversation and adjusted the services we deliver in permanent supportive housing to, um, to accommodate the fact that many of the tenants who are coming in are particularly vulnerable and present as much older than they are. So real quickly, I just wanted to touch on the study that we did was looking at, um, we, were, we took a sample um, of tenants in, from two different um, PSH providers here in Los Angeles in the Skid Row area. And we really wanted to just take a look at the prevalence of different geriatric syndromes. And this really built on the work of uh, one, our co-investigator, Rebecca Brown, and some of the work she has done with Margot Cushell. 
But what I'm presenting here is basically, you can see the blue is our sample. Um, and at the bottom, you can see different conditions, including impairment of uh, ADLs, activities of daily living. You can see falls in the prior year, difficulty with walking or balance, urinary incontin incontinence and frailty. So those are just some, some of the conditions we looked at. And you can see that the prevalence of these in, in our sample, which was a, a sample that did have an average age of 57 and, um, and an age range between 45 and, and 80, that you know, close to half our sample had one or more uh, of a lot of these conditions. And what you're seeing the comparison in this case in the, in the, the uh, red bars there is actually a, um, is a, uh, a community-based um, group of people who are, are housed and yet in their 70s, 70 or, or older. So even compared to um, a, a community sample, a representative sample who are much older, our, our sample looks much worse, right? So that, that's, that's the main message. But what stood out to us in particular was the amount of falls that we were seeing in, in that people were reporting in the past year. Uh, over half our sample had one or more falls. So halfway through the study, we kind of looked, uh, we tried to dig a little bit more deeply into this issue. And so we don't have information on our full sample, but for the 66 people that we started asking these additional questions, we wanted to know, you know, whether they were injured in their falls, or they were serious, where the falls happened, the, these sorts of questions. And so the, the main takeaway from this, and, and the, the references are here, and I, I can share this with anyone who's interested, but we did see that, um, you know, uh, a, a large percentage had uh, serious injuries uh, from their falls and that they were occurring both in their apartment and at, outside uh, and in different places. So it wasn't just in their bathroom, it was other places in, in, their, in their apartment. So what, what we're doing right now actually is we, we, were, we sort of surveyed the existing ev evidence-based interventions that could address this issue and landed on one in particular uh, known as the capable model that was really designed for people who are, are being discharged from older adults uh, who are being discharged from the hospital, uh, going back to independent living. And the, um, and the capable model basically consists of home visits that are done by a, an occupational therapist and a nurse uh, who on a time limited basis, this is uh, you, the intervention occurs over six months or shorter, um, it, it's intended to reduce falls and improve um, and improve activities of daily living. And, and it, is, it has been a, uh, approved as an evidence-based practice. We have seen um, better outcomes with this, including reduced costs. And, um, and it is now being implemented in 16 states across the country and, and internationally as well. And the, and the, OT and the nurse work hand in hand, uh, but also uh, assess for environmental changes that need to happen within one's living uh, space. Um, so that for instance, they might need better lighting, they might need uh, grab bars in the bathroom, these sorts of things that actually would need to be adjusted. So that's part of the capable model. But fundamental to it is, and this is why it, I think it aligns very well with per, uh, permanent supportive housing and housing first is, uh, underlying it, it is also a person-centered intervention. So currently we are, uh, we are planning a clinical trial for this year. We wanna look at whether the good outcomes we see and capable for um, older adults will um, play out with um, tenants in permanent supportive housing. So we're gonna look at the impact on ADLs and falls. And specifically, we want to look at what sort of ad adaptations, if any, need to be made uh, given the context uh, of permanent supportive housing. So that's a, that's a clinical trial that um, should be uh, beginning very shortly, uh, assuming that it also does not get disrupted through, um, through the, uh, our current uh, public health uh, crisis, which, which it may, but we, we'll see. So we should have uh, uh, findings by, by the end of 2020. 
And I think because my time is up, I will leave it there for now. So thank you. Thanks so much. As you saw, audience, we saw initial presentation on adolescence and now the uh, needs of older adults and in permanent supportive housing. Now we're going to pivot to uh, Professor Andy Potter, whose research really looks at what healthcare systems and hospitals are doing with respect to addressing homelessness. So. Uh, Dr. Potter. So, um, yes, yeah, so thank you, Hector. As mentioned, I'll be reporting uh, the findings of a study we did in which we looked at this issue from sort of uh, sort of from the other side of the telescope, right, from the health system perspective, um, and also sort of uh, from a you know, from a system perspective. You know, we've we've had a, some focus on sort of uh, individual uh, individuals, but we're taking sort of a thirty thousand foot view here as well, right? What are health systems doing in um, uh, broadly speaking. So we'll get into that in a second. Um, there we go. So at first I wanted to uh, acknowledge the work of my co-authors and students, uh, as well as our financial support that we received internally at Chico State. Um, I also particularly want to acknowledge our community partners from Enlo Medical Center and the Jesus Center uh, in uh, here in Chico, I, uh, they, they provided valuable guidance regarding the uh, regarding how to make these uh, the, these findings most uh, most relevant. Um, finally, I do want to to thank Assembly Member Chu and California Initiative for Health Equity and Action for this event. So, from the health systems perspective, um, patients experiencing homelessness have poor health and. Uh, and, and use really like too much of the wrong kind of care, right? They use too little preventive health care and too much emergency care. And this is sort of harmful both in terms of uh, health and in terms of uh, costs really to the healthcare system. So in addition to permanent supportive housing, which, we, uh, which was just discussed, uh, there are other interventions that have the potential to improve the health of this population. Uh, medical respite, which uh, provides transitional housing with supportive, uh, you know, largely nursing care uh, at the time of hospital discharge to patients who are not ready to, to, to return to, to, to the environment that they have available to them, um, as well as mobile medical clinics, which have the potential to, and in many cases do, uh, serve, uh, provide outpatient care to, uh, to individuals, both sheltered and un unsheltered, uh, who reside in the community. Um, there's significant evidence to suggest that all three interventions have the potential to be to be cost effective uh, at the societal level, but a lot of times the cost savings are shared uh, among a number of institutions because we're siloed, right? As has been mentioned a couple of times, uh, they might be uh, there might be savings to the criminal justice system, to healthcare organizations, to social service providers, but no one organization is necessarily going to look and say this is a this is an investment we want to make is to to is to really take the lead in in uh, one of these initiatives that has the potential to benefit the health of uh, patients or individuals experiencing homelessness. So uh, we sought. Uh, you know, if we read the newspaper, we see that some organizations and some health systems, some hospitals are engaging in these initiatives. And so we've sought to figure out why and how they did so. Um, so what we did, uh, hospitals, I mean, nonprofit hospitals are required as a condition of maintaining their nonprofit, not-for-profit status uh, to produce a periodic uh, community health needs assessment and uh, in which they identify the health needs of their community and discuss their strategy for, um, for how they're going to address those needs through their community benefit activities. Um, so we read these reports for nonprofit hospitals uh, in New York, Washington, Hawaii, and California chosen to represent various parts of the country with high rates of homelessness. Um, we excluded small hospitals as well. So we were looking to sort of quantify the extent of involvement in the initiatives previously mentioned, as well as to identify interesting possible cases. And we, we identified six California uh, hospitals or really health systems um, for follow-up interviews in which they discussed uh, um, uh, the nature of their interventions and their experience to date. So what we found um, to a large extent is that California hospitals are relatively more active in these interventions than in other states. It's worth, worth pointing out that this is still a minority of hospitals that are engaged in any of the interventions I mentioned previously, or uh, we also coded rental assistance, direct rental assistance, which a few hospitals were doing. Um, 
Uh, so 80% of hospitals in California and 13% across the four states were engaged in those interventions. A number of hospitals also reported some other type of activity. Usually these were smaller activities uh, related to being part of a community collaborative or maybe being involved in uh, an initiative led by another organization in the community. Um, and these, you know, if we took sort of broader, the broadest definition we could possibly take, about 37% of hospitals in California and 24% across the four states were engaged in these, uh, these initiatives. Uh, now, uh, the most common type of, uh, of intervention reported by hospitals, and again, I want to emphasize that we're looking at hospitals here, so this is part of what we're seeing, is, uh, is medical respite, which was, um, which was, uh, which was reported by about 15% of hospitals in California, something they're doing, uh, and about 11% uh, across the four states. Um, so in addition, we were also interested in determining the characteristics of hospitals uh, that were most likely to engage in these interventions. We found clear evidence that uh, the availability of greater resources was associated with a uh, greater likelihood of, of, of engaging in this kind of inter intervention. Um, it, you know, this, this includes like larger hospitals, those with affiliated with the network that might be able to provide resources. Those were more active hospitals. We initially thought that hospitals at greater financial risk for their patients' healthcare use might be more likely to engage, such as those you know, more subject to managed care arrangements. Uh, we didn't really find that. I will say that a, uh, a, a complementary study that was recently published in Health Affairs in February did find that membership or participation in an accountable care organization was associated with hospitals being more likely to uh, be more likely to engage in, uh, invest in social determinants of health, including health. So to some extent, our two studies. Um, we thought that, uh, we thought also that hospitals, um, that hospitals uh, uh, would be more likely to engage in interventions if they were in an area where uh, homelessness was particularly prevalent. Uh, we didn't find that either, although I will note that sort of across the board, we were looking at areas where homelessness is, is highly prevalent, right, it's including in our, in our own state, in all parts of our own, own state. Um, and finally, uh, you know, California hospitals remain more likely in our multivariable analyses to, uh, to be engaged in some kind of intervention uh, targeted toward homeless patient populations. And uh, this is partly but not entirely explained by the fact that California hospitals we're most, most likely to be affiliated with the network. I think there's probably something else going on in California that maybe the policy environment, and maybe I'll have some time to speculate a little bit on, on what might be going on on a later slide as well. So in our follow-up uh, interviews with six California uh, hospital administrators, mostly involved in sort of community engagement type of activities, um, we found a few different themes. First, uh, hospitals did report engaging in these interventions for more than one reason. On the one hand, we did find hospitals saying that they aimed to reduce uh, reduce healthcare use by their most expensive patients, but uh, but no single hospital no hospital said that was their primary or their sole motivation. We also saw uh, religious affiliation or community mission driven reasons reported, as well as just sort of desire to improve the quality of care uh, by investing in social determinants of health. Um, hospitals, regardless of their uh, goals. Pretty much across the board, they did report that they improved uh, health and uh, reduced uh, healthcare utilization, uh, undesirable healthcare utilization, uh, often exceeding their expectations. And I want to dig a little bit more into these third and fourth themes, uh, which I think are, are most relevant to this audience as well. So um, most interventions were not broadly available to all uh, patients experiencing homelessness, uh, most targeted uh, specific subpopulation of some kind. This was driven by one or two, uh, one or two factors. Often hospitals were partnering with a, a community service provider that itself offered a particular kind of service targeted to sub subpopulation, including you know, women, for example, right? And so therefore, um, therefore the, the intervention itself would also be targeted to, to that group. Uh, sometimes it was based on hospitals' um, identification of the subpopulation with a particular need. For example, patients with cancer uh, who, due to their uh, treatment, might be uh, uh, immunosuppressed and therefore it would be inappropriate to send them to a particular particular setting, right? So, or, or those with high healthcare utilization, for example, right? Uh, some hospitals identified their highest uh, utilizers through their emergency department and focused on that. 
Um, in addition, the importance of collaboration was uh, sort of repeatedly emphasized. Uh, health systems were most successful where the initiative was a true collaboration, right, in which each organization focused on its own expertise. Um, as a counterexample, one effort that failed was an effort in which a health system was more sort of a purchaser of medical respite days from a uh, from 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 a medical respite run by a homeless services organization. And this fell apart when the uh, when the organization sort of changed the price of the day that they were charging to the hospital, right? And uh, you know, issues like this, and I think this is illustrated in the second quote here also. Um, the needs of each organization are different. There was there was a requirement. Uh, it, was, it was sort of viewed as necessary to have a true partnership through which uh, uh, differing goals could be could be negotiated by the partners. Um, and in addition, hospitals reported barriers to, to implementing these these at multiple levels. Some of the other panelists can speak to this issue of individual level barriers, such as instances in which hospitals or services or service providers offered a uh, offered a service that was not wanted by an individual, right? Uh, and so in that case, the intervention was sort of not successful. Um, I think you know, uh, Ben spoke to that briefly, right? Uh, it was regard to person-centeredness. Um, and uh, I think, uh, the, I, I wanna spend the rest of my time talking about these sort of local and state policy issues as well. So uh, community opposition was raised as a barrier in many cases, right? A, a lot of these partnerships ran into siting issues um, due to community opposition and either had to choose a new site, a new approach, or abandon a particular initiative altogether. Um, I, th I think it's worth noting that we have, uh, that sort of at the state level, we have, we have taken issue, we have made certain types of uh, more difficult to prevent at the local level and you know that has not necessarily included medical respite to this point but i think that's uh, potentially relevant to consider uh, as well um there are also uh, sort of specific uh, partnership issues that were raised as well um there the in one instance there was a rental assistance program uh relied on the local housing authority to allocate vouchers directly to the program they no longer wanted to do that they wanted to go back to sort of a first in line uh if you keep people in, in the order in which they received vouchers, which caused the challenge for the partnership, right? Uh, there were disputes around the, what, what like the stay is appropriate in medical respite with healthcare providers viewing this more as a medical service. And so once you're healthier, you should be discharged and uh, others others viewing this as more of a housing service, right? In which case, if you have somewhere, uh, if you, in which case you shouldn't be discharged in, in case, you, uh, excuse me, unless you have somewhere uh, adequate to, to go. Um, the issue of SB 750, uh, excuse me, 1152 around discharge planning was raised by several uh, interviewees. Uh, I mean, our, our get data, data were get gathered uh, prior to the uh, implementation of this law. So I would note that California hospitals were already doing more, possibly due to the sort of, uh, you know, local public attention paid to the issue of discharge of, of patients experiencing almost reported the law for uh, local conversations, right? They had local, uh, you know, um, it, 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 it was a signal coming from the state, right? That, that this was something that they needed to deal with. Um, one hospital did report that this was a barrier to a medical respite partnership. They had a potential partner that was located not extremely close to the hospital, and they feared they would run afoul of the law if this was their, their, uh, their plan. Uh, you know, based on my read of the law, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with their interpretation. But I, I did want to uh, mention that that was at least they at least uh, believed that this was a barrier to in, engaging uh, with a service provider that they wanted to partner with. Um, and I think the final thing I wanted to mention is this idea of uh, dreams. Uh, hospitals uh, reported challenges due to the lack of consistent, predictable funding for this kind of initiative. I think uh, Assembly Member Chu alluded to this kind of challenge. Uh, some hospitals were funding their uh, services through one-time grants and therefore faced challenges sustaining them over the long term. Others relied on funding from hospital operations themselves, which, uh, which could be challenged if the hospital administration's priorities uh, changed as well. And um, I think it is worth restating at this point that, that there's sort of a lack of a clear signal, right? Uh, you know, we can identify agencies, uh, federal and state funding streams that, that sort of uh, do provide some support for some of these services. I think medical respite is a bit unclear, but most hospitals aren't engaged in any of these, even in the state of California. 
right? The majority are doing, are, are, are not engaged in any of these initiatives. Um, many community health needs assessments we read stated that housing is an important local priority, that what, one of the major local issues is homelessness. And then they report that because that is not the responsibility of the hospital, they don't intend to, to, to take, it, take any kind of action on that. So um, I do think that a funding stream sends a clear signal uh, about uh, about whose responsibility uh, something is, as we see with mobile medical clinics, which are largely provided by federally qualified health centers due to the funding stream that's, that's available directly to them. So I think I'm going to skip this following slide, which I mostly discussed. Uh, if you want to read our study or the complementary study I referenced, I've given the references here. And um, thank you very much. Thanks, Professor Potter, uh, for that uh, great presentation. Some of the challenges of uh, health systems uh, going into this space without a lot of guidance in terms of where to invest and how to invest. Um, our next presenter is the executive director of the new UCSF Benioff Housing and Health Initiative, uh, uh, Ms. Cynthia Nagendra. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm really pleased to be able to join such a fantastic panel. And I would like to talk uh, today briefly about, um, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the, the new initiative at UCSF, and then kind of focus more on what an effective homeless response system really ideally should look like, and, and what's there's some po policy solutions around there to sort of help fit some of these different intervention pieces together and kind of get a more holistic picture of how we um, ideally uh, want to see these things come together and how in communities, um, when you see these pieces uh, much more coordinated, you actually do see uh, impacts in homelessness. So uh, I am uh, the executive director of a new uh, research and policy center at the Benioff Homeless uh, at UCSF called the Benioff Homelessness and Housing Initiative. Um, many of you um, might uh, be familiar with Dr. Margaret Cushell's work. She is the director of the Center for Vulnerable Populations, which is where this new initiative is housed, uh, and her Hope Hogan study in particular, which is on aging homelessness in Oakland. Uh, and I previously have um, ha spent most of my career in, in, in homelessness services policy and capacity building, most recently at the National Alliance to End Homelessness. The vision for uh, BHHI, which again is a new um, enterprise, is to really provide policy-oriented research um, that is focused on preventing and ending homelessness. And it will sort of um, try to uniquely respond to this problem with the focus on solutions while collaborating with um, other researchers and policymakers, practitioners, and people experiencing homelessness that are already in the space from the very beginning. So we're doing an, uh, an incredible amount of stakeholder engagement from the beginning to conduct rigorous and impact-oriented research that's really designed with the end users um, and, and translate this evidence into action. But hopefully we are sort of already designing the, the research questions from the beginning and, and sort of the translation piece will really be kind of more iterative. Um, and the, the, the hope is to inform effective, scalable homelessness and housing policies, innovative strategies, realistic solutions, and that's to impact homelessness in the San Francisco Bay Area, California, and have some of our research hopefully um, be useful to the field across the U.S. And we're really trying to ultimately aid in the creation of healthier communities for everyone. Um, we'll have key, uh, the key areas we'll be working on our research policy communications and education, which is really trying to train the next generation of researchers in this in this area. So today I'm going to talk about the components of an effective homeless response system and policy solutions. I've spent a lot of my career working all over the country as well as in California and the Bay Area and San Francisco. So I've worked in 30 or 40 communities um, and it's really gotten a sense for what works and what doesn't work. Um, many of the things that we are employing in California are working. We just have a, a real housing shortage and scale issue here, but I will talk a little bit more about that. As you have probably heard um, some of these pretty dire statistics, California has about 130,000 people on any given night uh, that are homeless in the state. That number um, over the year, if you annualize that number, it's about two or two and a half to three times that uh, of people who experience homelessness over any uh, given year in California. And over two thirds of people, um, about 72% of people are unsheltered. Um, so that's a, that's a really high population of people who are actually living outside. Uh, or and that means in their cars, in encampments, uh, but places that are not meant for human habitation. They're not even in shelters. And the largest group of people experiencing homelessness in California are individuals. And, and one thing that's um, important to sort of note there is that individuals, unlike um, uh, families or people who are chronically homeless, which may include individuals or veterans, 
the individuals who are non-chronic or non-veterans uh, sort of receive the least amount of targeted funding, the least amount of services. They kind of get what's left over, which probably explains um, why there are that, that is a growing population, especially in the unsheltered. And one important disparity to um, really pay attention to is that California has an enormous racial disparity in people experiencing homelessness. African Americans make up 40% of California's homeless population, ju though just 6.5% of the general population of Californians. Sorry about that pop up. I'm not sure why that's happening. So why are people homeless in California? I think you're familiar with this, uh, but I'll just uh, start here for just a second. The causes of homelessness are not the fault of people who are homeless. This crisis was caused by decades of policy decisions at all levels, local, state, and federal, which have resulted in a constrained housing supply, severe rent burdens, lack of access to health and behavioral health care. And the majority of people experiencing homelessness lost their housing due to housing costs that do not match people's incomes. People's incomes um, have stayed stagnant, while housing costs have risen to three to four times what people can afford. And over half of the population of the entire state of California is rent burdened, so can't afford housing. They're paying over 30% of their income. Lack of access to adequate health care uh, uh, and structural racism and other inequities are also major reasons that people are losing their housing. So I'm going to focus on solutions here. Um, one myth I like to sort of start out with is that we don't know how to solve homelessness. So people look around and they see what's happening in their communities, and they see what's happening on the streets, and they must think, well, we obviously don't know how to solve this problem. We've been throwing money at it, been trying different things, but we must not know how to solve it. But the fact is we actually have a lot of evidence, which I'm sure you've heard from other panelists, of what works to end homelessness. We know that the solution to homelessness is housing. Very, very simply, a difficult market-based solution, certainly difficult in California. But the evidence, um, and we have a lot, years and years of evidence to show us that the solution is really the most effective way to get people um, to exit homelessness, to stay housed, and to be able to address their health uh, and other individual vulnerabilities that have maybe contributed to their homelessness or were exacerbated during homelessness, but housing is really the platform to give them the ability to do that. Um, and components of a, an effective response system are uh, important to kind of understand so that we realize that it's not a program by program response. The country and many states and communities have decreased homelessness by putting these pieces together and coordinating funding across several siloed systems um, and building things to scale. So the goal of an effective homeless response system is really to house people as quickly as possible and divert people from imminent homelessness whenever possible. So all interventions ideally should be geared towards this, even emergency interventions, um, even, you know, and then support services should be sort of helping, you know, kind of support this goal. But if we have interventions that are, you know, really just keeping temporarily people warehoused and uh, not really thinking about the housing piece, then we're not really sort of being, uh, we're not effectively solving homelessness, we're managing it or putting a band aid on it. Another critical part uh, of the approach is using a systemic approach. So you're aligning interventions and resources, services across programs and siloed systems in this very coordinated way around this common goal. We really learned this um, through the ending, through many different examples, but in the Ending Veteran Homeless Initiative, which was um, happened uh, around, started around 2010 under the Obama administration, where the VA and HUD um, and um, the Obama administration put a number of resources, housing and services uh, together, enough money to really house two or three times the amount of homeless veterans in the country. And about 72 communities and three states have now ended better in homelessness, some very big cities and all types of communities. But it, the, the communities that were able to do that, they didn't just do it because they were funded through housing. They really had to coordinate their health care um, the housing system and the providers, build the capacity in the providers to provide the services. So the money was not enough, which is why many communities did not end veteran homelessness, um, and the ones that did really kind of the systemic approach is the one that really worked. So the elements of a homeless response system that you want to have sort of all uh, kind of coordinated together, you, do, you need a skills and an immediate outreach to people who are homeless. We need to get to people as quickly as we can when, when they become homeless, ideally before they become homeless. 
Um, and we want to make sure that outreach is actually connected to shelter, housing, and systems of care, and coordinated with law enforcement, not criminalizing folks, but making sure it's coordinated so that people aren't just getting moved around. We're leaving people on the street for far too long, and that's why their health is getting worse and worse, and why people are seeing this sort of on the streets and thinking, well, we don't know what's, what's happening. Um, a lot of, it's not that you know, outreach workers aren't doing incredibly good hard work, but they often don't have anything for people to outreach to. Giving people, you know, health care on the street, um, giving them people sort of things that they can use to live outside is not really, again, it, it's just not giving them a sort of solution. And that's usually because of a lack of resources and care available. You also want to have low barrier and housing focused emergency shelter and temporary beds. So this is the sort of triage piece. There needs to be a short term triage piece this includes navigation centers, community cabins, farm structures, all these things you've kind of heard about happening in different communities. The key is to make sure that they're accessible and designed for people's needs and that they're completely focused on housing. You want a range of permanent housing options and that can include self-resolution services because a, a significant percentage of people actually self-resolve on their own with very little help or almost no assistance. Diversion from homelessness or prevention services very flexible financial rental assistance, and that might be also include shallow subsidies uh, per, or one-time assistance before or after being housed. Um, rapid rehousing, which is a short, medium-term rental subsidy, which includes move-in support with professionalized housing navigation and housing source services. Oftentimes, people will say that rapid rehousing doesn't work so well, um, and then people can't afford their housing. A lot of that has to do with the fact that housing is very expensive, but also the the, the rental assistance doesn't necessarily come with the housing services that people really need um, and doesn't help sort of increase their income so they can keep that housing. Permanent supportive housing, which is really for um, a smaller percentage of the population who have very intensive needs, often people who are chronically homeless. That's a long-term rental subsidy with intensive services. Of course, vouchers, which ideally we would love to have for everybody. Policy-wise, we know that that is um, a very difficult battle. National community supports are really important in coordination of mainstream systems of care, health, behavioral health, employment, and housing stabilization support services. So this is kind of the picture you want to have for a real robust system um, that really responds to the emergency of homelessness um, and, you, you know, obviously requires a lot of coordination. And to increase system flow is what the goal is. In other words, People, we want to increase the flow of people from homelessness to housing and make that as quick as possible and prevent homelessness where we can. Most communities are experiencing poor system flow, unchanging or increasing number of unsheltered people, wait lists, long lengths of stay in shelter that's just sort of serving as their housing or living on the street, high percentage of exits from shelters actually back into homelessness because there wasn't really any housing services for them, inflow into homelessness is steady or increasing, long wait lists for housing, uh, significant amount of people aren't getting any kind of assistance. So this is kind of the, the that we're, you know, we have a lot of sort of bottlenecks in many communities, and this is what a lot of communities end up uh, sort of having to, to, to deal with because they don't have all of those pieces. So some policy solutions um, are, you know, it's really not rocket science, it's sort of short term and long term. So it's investing in building extremely low income housing to match the actual need to, to deal with the housing shortage and really building housing at all levels immediate targeted triage crisis strategies to help the most underserved and unsheltered people, almost like a disaster response, like if we could stand up a disaster response the way we would with a fire or a virus, like what would what, what would it look like to really get people off the street and into something that was um, really going to help them get, get housed. Structural changes that will coordinate state funding and really promote accountability at the state and local levels for those things, so how much housing you're going to produce, how are you going to get people off the street, how are we going to fund you to be able to have that capacity? Greater access to health and behavioral health care, and that's preventative before homelessness, during homelessness, after housing. We don't want to wait till people are in crisis, which is often how our, our systems are set up for health care. Building capacity and providers to navigate the existing housing market, which means professionalized housing services, a greater investment in state policy advocacy resources. There's very little um, advocacy happening at the uh, sort of people doing advocacy the public's education of what works and what doesn't, and more research to observe and test innovative pro uh, programmatic approaches. And so the short-term ones, as I've talked about, these short-term strategies are really the sort of ones that we need for immediate response. Shelter should really be part of a process of housing, not as a destination. So we talk a lot about why don't we build more shelter. They need to be 
attached to housing resources or people are going to get stuck there. People need access to flexible financial assistance, flexible funding pots. The flexible housing subsidy pool in Los Angeles is an excellent example of how to braid and blend funding across different siloed programs. I can talk more about that. Um, and long-term strategies really is about rental assistance, building housing, and reducing the cost of building housing because there's many barriers. You can ask LA, they got billions of dollars to tax increase, and they've had a really hard time reducing zoning restrictions, NIMBYism, um, other state and local building restrictions while finding a balance with local needs. And we can try more cost-effective housing models and strengthen safety nets. Medicaid, SSI, SSDA, CalWORKs, and maybe add rental subsidies to these existing income supports that people already have but aren't quite getting them to the place where they can afford housing and, and, and health care services. And with that, I am uh, going to hand it back. Thank you so much. Um, one of the things at Cal IHEA we'd like to make sure is that uh, advocates and community-based uh, folks are able to ask questions of the great faculty and uh, researchers we have here. So I'm going to introduce uh, Cal IHEA Health Policy Fellow Maurice Richardson, who will then introduce the Q&A. Yes, hello. My name is Maurice Richardson, a first year, gradu first year graduate student in the Health Policy and Management Program. I just want to say thank you for everybody who's able to attend this briefing. Uh, right now, I want to be able to pass it on to uh, Eli Moore who is the Director of Community Partnerships at the Othering Belonging Institute. Uh, Eli Moore has done a little bit about him. Eli Moore has done some work within housing affordability, some analysis around displacement within the Bay Area, and uh, also has uh, a background in participatory uh, research. So I would like to just pass it on to Eli Moore. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Maurice. Hello, everybody. Thank you to the speakers. This is a really informative panel, I think really timely and uh, very actionable. Um, I thought I would offer just a couple short comments and, um, and then um, please start adding questions to the uh, chat. Um, and if you'd, uh, if you'd like to articulate, verbally articulate your question, just put in the chat that, that you have a question, we'll use that as the cue. Otherwise, um, just type out your question there. And if it's for a specific speaker, um, please just name the speaker. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, recently at, at the Institute, we did a, a study on segregation in the Bay Area and using ver various measurements. And, and we saw that racial residential segregation um, currently is pretty similar to what it was in 1970. Um, and so I, I think that it is important to give a little bit of a historical context to some of these issues, um, in particular, the racial disparities. Um, so we, we saw, you know, we see racial disparities throughout the housing system. We saw it in the subprime lending. Um, we see it in home ownership. We see it in uh, rent. Um, we see it in income. Um, evictions and, and ultimately homelessness. And so I think, you know, we're talking about homelessness, but we're also talking about a broader system that is dynamic, that um, involves uh, actors like uh, realtors and developers, uh, as well as public, um, you know, jurisdictions at each level of governance. Um, and then I think just to bring in one other lens um, that, that people have touched on a little bit, but the intersection with various public and private systems, um, I think, is is really important here. And so, you know, we we've um, talked about health systems. Um, there's also the criminal justice system. Obviously, uh, people coming home from incarceration and the barriers that they face um, in finding housing, even though they're often required to have housing uh, as a condition of their parole or probation. Um, that doesn't mean they actually do have it. And, and so those, you know, the justice system itself can create barriers and then the, the stigma attached to justice involvement, um, additional barriers. Um, and then uh, immigration or, or immigration system and in particular some of the, some existing and, and new laws, public charge and, and others that are um, raising fears amongst the immigrant community about any interaction with public systems that uh, that perhaps 
calling for services or engaging with public systems will raise the risk of deportation. Um, that also poses problems and, and creates other barriers. Um, and then um, some of the local systems like city planning and the siting challenges a couple of people mentioned, um, as well as libraries are, are often kind of the last resort. Um, and, um, and, and, and then public transit as well being kind of like a last resort um, where people are finding shelter or, um, or, or some kind of rest or respite. Um, so I just wanted to give uh, those two comments about the kind of historical context, in particular the racialized housing system and then some of the other intersections with, with public systems. Um, and it looks like we have a couple questions starting to come up. So please um, continue to, to add questions to the chat. Um, this question from Laura Moreno is, Cynthia, how do we begin to incorporate shared housing as a solution for high housing costs and low income levels? Yeah, that's a great question. So this sort of goes back to the, the idea that we have to navigate the current housing market. We can't wait for all the new housing to be built because that will take a long time. So we have to figure out how to help people navigate and exist in the current housing market. And one way people are doing that is to try shared housing, which is essentially just having roommates. Um, there's different shared housing models, but essentially it means trying, instead of the idea sort of that every person gets their own apartment, which we know is unrealistic for many, many Californians um, of all of many income levels, we um, have been seeing in various pockets of the state and around the country, uh, communities trying different types of shared housing models. So in Los Angeles, for example, um, there is a program called LA Family Housing, um, and they provide uh, tons of, of an array of housing and shelter um, and, and prevention services to not just families, but individuals and families they serve thousands of people in Los Angeles. And because the cost of housing is so high there, um, things like rapid rehousing sometimes just don't get people or people on sustained incomes or um, fixed incomes like SSI just aren't going to be enough to get them housed. So they actually have a roommate matching program, for example. They've created a tool. It's a lot like um, almost like a match.com where people just fill out um, their preferences for a roommate when they're in their programs, who they would be sort of a lot, you know, who they'd want to live with. The program helps them figure out uh, the piece with the landlord. Um, so sometimes they're getting separate leases in one apartment. Sometimes they're getting one lease. Sometimes it's a master lease with the with the provider. Um, but it's essentially just, a, and they're not taking on liability for for this unless it's a master lease. Um, but they're sort of just doing roommate matching. Another way people are doing shared housing that's that's in LA and that's actually happening in a few places across the state. Um, I know that people um, there's a program in in Virginia that um, started actually trying to match because it's a very rural area where there's not a lot of rental housing, which I think also probably applies certainly to the Central Valley. Uh, there's not a lot of rental housing available, so renting rooms in, in houses, buying single family homes, turning them into separate rooms, and either the program can buy the house or um, the program is negotiating with the landlord to give separate leases to people on a room by room basis. So they might be sharing things like bathrooms and kitchens. Um, and sometimes they're actually converting single family homes into places that are like, you know, sort of have each, you know, SROs so that people are living together, but they have their own, you know, their own door and their own small kitchen, maybe their own bathroom. Um, and so in uh, this program in, in um, Virginia, they actually started pairing people together in a rural area that are chronically homeless, thinking that that might be really challenging, but they've been able to figure out kind of ways to match people together. A lot of times seniors want to live together. They don't want to live alone. Um, people who've been living in encampments don't want to live alone. They, want, they like the community. They miss having a community. So some people really prefer having a shared housing um, situation. People who have been using substances don't like living alone. It's often they find it to be safer to be in an encampment or to have other people around them in case they overdose or have a health issue. Um, and so there's a lot of reasons people want to live together and providers and, and sort of systems are figuring out ways to be creative and trying to make that happen. Great, thank you. Um, this question is, uh, is for anybody who wants to take it. Have certain hospital interventions proven more effective than others? Maybe Andrew or anybody? 
Yeah, I, I'm unaware of sort of direct comparisons. I think that, that having read the evidence based on some of them, I think the strongest evidence, and maybe uh, you know Ben or Norwegian may may, may agree or, or not agree, but I think the strongest evidence base is in favor of suburban supporting housing. Um, you're partly partly that's going to be due to the population that's targeted, right? And it's going to depend what we mean by more effective, also, right? If what we mean by more effective is Reduction in healthcare expenditures. You're targeting a population that 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 very often has, you know, chronically homeless population that has a very very high rates of health expenditures. Similarly, you know, people with a lot of health needs, so their health has more room to be improved. So I think that's where the strongest um, the strongest evidence base I've seen. But I'd, I'd be interested to hear the thoughts of others as well. This is uh, Ben. I can just chime in too because I'm not sure exactly what a hospital intervention means, but but to the extent that um, any time you're transitioning from one setting to another, uh, it's that that can be a vulnerable time. And so, so we do know that there are interventions like critical time intervention um, that has been used for discharging from hospitals, but also from jail to help uh, with housing stability during that transition uh, has proven effective. Great, thanks all. I had a question for Norwida. I wanted to ask you what barriers um, pose a challenge to piloting the Strive model in California, or, or put differently, maybe what can be built off that exists? I think um, the barrier that I kind of alluded to is we have very siloed systems in California and Connecticut for dealing with young people. The systems are not as siloed in that they do interact with one another, um, they seem to be less territorial. Some of the funding streams support not having siloed systems, and we don't see that in California. So for example, I mean, when you look at, um, when you're talking about interventions for homeless adolescents, if you kind of step back and think about kind of what do all adolescents need for healthy trajectories. So education is important. At the end of education, um, um, employment is important. And, you know, when we address kind of how to work those systems together to meet the needs of adolescents, then I think we would see better outcomes. But our, our service sector are siloed and that I'd say is a major barrier. Okay. And um and and Ben as far as the um the uh, implementing or advancing a housing first strategy statewide, what public policies or public investments do you would think would be make a big difference? Yeah, I mean the the issue uh, that I Cynthia spoke to is you know housing first is effective when you when you have the uh, necessary components, which is the housing and the support services. So the the lack of housing is just you know critical and the, sort of the huge elephant in, in the room in all these discussions. So anything that's going to support the expansion uh, of of housing, but at the same time the supports are also critical. Um, you know if you're talking about a permanent supportive housing. And I think to the extent that not all the necessary supports, like for instance, what we were talking about, the capable model, uh, you know, can't, uh, in many places that's supported by Medicare, but our target population isn't gonna qualify. And so it would have to be covered by Medi-Cal, uh, which currently won't, won't cover capable or the OT practice. So they, I think there are issues on, on both sides that uh, need to be uh, worked out in that regard. Yeah, so really scaling up investment and actually building substantial numbers of housing. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and I, I do think, I mean, the, all the innovation you see, I, I think is great in terms of the, the health systems getting involved in, um, it, it, on the housing side. On the other hand, the, the flip side to that, I think, is that, you know, fundamentally they're doing that because the... Uh, you know, at a federal level where there isn't enough support for affordable housing. And so these are innovations that happen to fill in that gap that uh, had, you know, uh, HUD been, uh, you know, funded uh, 
more substantially, then we, we wouldn't need as many of these sort of newer practices that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. and, and Andrew, you, you mentioned that the, the hospital uh, initiatives are cost effective system wide, but not for individual organizations. And so I wanted to ask what approaches for collective action you've seen and, and what might create a kind of platform for that. Yeah, I mean, to the extent that um, to the extent that these programs uh, need to find funding, right? They've either been, um, you know, hospitals in some instances have felt some some motivation, right? Either they're trying to reduce the the healthcare utilization of their own their own patients, right? Um, which is one form of motivation, right? You can sort of see the disconnect between what Ben was just saying, which if our goal is to have healthy people and housed people, right? That's not exactly the same as the goal of reducing healthcare, uh, healthcare utilization, right? But uh, nonetheless, some, some have found it, uh, some have, 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 have found that to be a, a motivating factor. Um, I think, you know, in, uh, in a lot of instances, I think what would help, right, is a clear, you know, so with regard to medical respite in particular, I think what would help is sort of a clear funding stream. And I understand um, that the, uh, the CalAIM, the new Medi-Cal, uh, the Medi-Cal waiver renewal may, may enable Medi-Cal plans to, to offer that kind of funding stream, right? Uh, I'm not sure if the plans will necessarily choose to offer that kind of funding stream or if they will choose to do so in a way that people think that that organizations feel is uh sustainable but i think it's i mean i think the question you raise is, is a challenging one it's like who's going to take uh at least from the health system side right i mean i think you know what ben's suggesting is we have an agency who could take responsibility for this problem from the health system side in the interim it's not clear uh it's not clear to me um you know, who, who is going to take ownership of a local problem of, uh, given that they may or may not recoup their, recoup their investment, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Thanks. We have a question here uh, for anybody. Uh, has there been any successful models that have, oh, that combine youth interventions upstream with the senior aging in place shared housing? How have these types of living situations differ in rural versus urban settings? So I, I have recently heard about a program, actually, but this is in Australia, um, that was sort of pairing seniors and, um, uh, and youth to be living in the same home. Uh, there's a program in New Zealand and in Australia, I can't remember which where, where it started first, um, that is essentially trying to pair people uh, young people who want the kind of structure of, of a family setting or uh, um, an older adult in the home. And, and then also um, there's uh, uh, a situation where seniors want support at home too. So there, there's, I'm not sure if, uh, Norita, you might have more ideas Actually, about that. There's a really exciting program here in Los Angeles that just opened yeah. through Safe Place for Youth. They have a bridge program in, um, Monica that is providing housing for seniors with lived experience and youth with lived experience. It has just opened in the last couple of last few weeks. So I think that's a really, really exciting opportunity and model. Now what will happen in the long run, um, we don't know, but it's at least we're seeing some of that on the ground here. We also have some of that on the ground here in Chico as well. It's not um, it's not targeted specifically to youth at risk of homelessness, but um, there's been at least within the California state and I think within the UC system acknowledgement that we have high rates of homelessness among our students. And so here in Chico, there's there's a program uh, to partner uh, uh, you know students with with uh, with uh, older adults who may want to age in place. And there's some what I've heard from. It's, it's challenging to always make a match, right? It's, it's challenging to find uh, a good match between these individuals. And so they expect to screen four people sort of on each side for every match they make. But, um, but uh, I believe they're, I mean, it, it sounds like the panel is sort of increasingly familiar with, with, with uh, initiatives in this area. Great to hear about those examples. We have another question here. You see nonprofit health systems making housing investments due to community benefits requirements or other value-based payment incentives, but are there any examples of non-health 
for-profit companies, i.e. Zillow or Redfin, making investments in programs, connecting people to affordable housing related to programs that connect, RE programs that connect individuals to professional services. This is Ben. I mean, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure that I know of that kind of specific example, but what I will say is you, you are seeing more for-profit companies, particularly in California, um, putting money into housing uh, in different ways. So, you know, different announcements from Apple putting 2.5 billion. It's not necessarily all for affordable housing, but um, I think there's a recognition, especially maybe even some guilt for some of the inequity that's driving high rates of homelessness uh, into housing, but, but not specific to that question, no. Yeah, and I, Zillow did put um, some money into research or using large, their, some of their data to show ties between homeless rent increases and um, across certain geographies and um, and homelessness. Like in LA, they put out something about two years, a year and a half ago that said about a five percent increase in rents in LA translated to about people about two thousand more people experiencing homelessness there, um, which is one of the highest correlation areas. I will say that the the, the nonprofit programs that are kind of um, finding the most success in placing people in housing that have really robust housing navigation, landlord engagement, services incentives um, in, in very expensive parts of the state have essentially professionalized their own services. So what's really needed for those providers, the ones that are trying to put people into housing, can't have social workers doing it. It's just it's a totally different set of skills. And so programs are having to, and this is a funding issue to really build capacity and pay their their um, their staff and build that really professionalized housing, you know, sort of property management, housing search, how landlord engagement services, pay staff that are professionalized to do this work, and they're kind of building that capacity in house. Um, it would be great if they could use, you know, more for profit services, but um, they're often having to build that themselves. So I had a question related to the the current um, situation with the coronavirus and just the heightened public attention around exposure and how that may color people's lens or concerns around um, people who are homeless or services or centers for homeless people um, and the kind of there was already stigma attached to um, to this community and the services, um, but we can also think about kind of public health paradigms that may shift that frame. And I'm just wondering, you know, what if if anybody has thoughts on or advice or guidance on um, this current moment and how to speak to these challenges. So I'm, I'm, I'm not a doctor. I'm going to just quote, though, Dr. Cushell, um, and she's been having to speak a lot on behalf of UCSF about this issue. Um, and following guidance from the Department of Public Health in San Francisco and the CDC, HUD also put out some guidance um, to help providers who were outreach workers and shelter providers and people working um, with people who are in closer quarters that may be very vulnerable, which is largely a lot of people experiencing homelessness. Um, but uh, you know that the increased stick, that the likelihood of uh, people experiencing homelessness spreading it to like other community members just because they are homeless, there's not like more of a likelihood they may be vulnerable. It's what it's spreading it to people who are in close quarters, like other people experiencing homelessness, like people in encampments who don't have access to anything that could help um, you know prevent uh, spread and who could you know things like sanitation and all of those things. Um, and like in San Francisco, they're putting out hand washing stations and things like that for people. But it's really, um, we don't want to increase the stigma of people experiencing homelessness being more, you know, uh, being more communicable in some ways, but rather that we should be thinking about how to help and protect people who are not going to have health care services, who are not going to have access to care, who are going to be more vulnerable, like people experiencing homelessness, especially people on the street and in shelters. Mm-hmm. And I, I should say that there's there's a call across, like for example, many Bay Area communities, and there's a call happening today with COCs across the state um, to 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 
sort of share best practices around how people are dealing with this, what they're doing to quarantine people, how they're making space for people. A lot of people are trying to open up hotel rooms, motel rooms for people so, and, and, make, and make services and food available to them um, instead of sort of putting people on one small area. So they're trying to follow practices. It's just sort of about creating this capacity and kind of responding immediately without a whole lot of guidance. Erica had a question. Uh, oh, Eli raised the importance of the history of racialized housing and law enforcement incarceration policy that have systematically disadvantaged communities of color and contributed to persistent racial ethnic health disparities. Are there examples of housing interventions that prioritize the unique barriers and needs experienced by marginalized communities of color? Similarly, are there any examples of health interventions that prioritize and address the unique housing needs that these communities have? For example, asthma interventions. I mean, I can say sort of on the homeless system side, this is, you know, really understanding the effects of structural racism and how the sort of decades of, of or much longer than that, the sort of really embedded structural racism in so many systems, um, how that has contributed to homelessness and how that um, we knew that, uh, for example, African Americans were three times or you know overrepresented in the in, in the homeless population just nationally and sometimes much more than that locally um but it is something the homeless system has been aware of but only started to really look at how to make sure that the home system itself is not um is not contributing to that disparity so trying to figure out what you know looking at data of your systems who's getting into access to services who's getting housed through homeless systems um are we doing anything to 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 prioritize people in a way that is actually causing a disparate uh, impact. So I wouldn't say that, um, that that's been figured out, but I would say that dialogue has started in, in a lot of communities. Um, but that's just on the homeless system side um, in terms of like actual, like what housing authorities do or um, what the house system does, I can't speak to that. Yeah, and, and just on our, on speaking only to our narrow study, I'm trying to rack my brain to think of the exact examples. But I, I think for the most part, I mean, everything was very, uh, I, I, I did not hear a lot of discussion of those kinds of issues, right? I mean, I can imagine, and, and uh, you can imagine how some of the citing issues might overlap with racial equity issues, uh, the, some of the citing issues uh, that, that we encountered, but uh, none of, um, I don't think anything we encountered was specifically targeted to address um, racial inequities in housing in that way. Oh, Eli, I'm glad that you raised the issue of um, the disproportionality that we see that's tied to kind of race and ethnicity in this country. So kind of echoing what um, Cynthia has said, we've been aware of this really, I think, probably since the 1980s. We've seen in places where we have large racial and ethnic minority communities, disproportionate representation of people of color in homeless populations. So it has been a problem, but I would say more recently, it's an issue that's getting much more attention and people are beginning to kind of, um, I think Cynthia's at least described on the service sector side, ways to begin to intervene to make sure that there's not a systemic bias built into the service sector. And people are kind of giving more attention to these kind of larger uh, social determinants um, and addressing homelessness. But it's really, I'd say it's still, um, I'd say at the discussion level and not, we're not seeing it as much in interventions yet. But I think that may be coming. Yeah, and I would just add one thing because I think that since Proposition 209 really prohibited um, race conscious uh, pol public policy in the state, um, we've, and, and because of a broader political context, we've been accustomed to, you know, what's called colorblind approaches where we kind of use other um, correlated attributes to think about race or talk about race um, or address racial disparities without specifically um, uh, naming and, and strategizing around the legacy of, 
um, racialized structures of, of housing and health and other systems. Um, and so I, I do think that as kind of a community of, of peers, we need to question that kind of received wisdom because from, from our research and, and others, it, it really hasn't worked to just counter bias or to try to create uh, policies that address racial disparities without ever naming, <laughs> naming race. So that may be controversial, but, but I do want to enter it, uh, add that to the mix. Um, and, and we're um, just about um, out of time, but, uh, but I, I got permission to ask one more question. Um, and, and there was this question about, um, have you heard any good strategies of preventing the spread of COVID-19 in homeless shelters? Yeah, I would, I would, uh, sorry again, that I would direct again to one, definitely what your local health department is saying around this, because that's probably the most important place to go. If they haven't developed a strategy there, the homeless system is probably trying to help them develop a strategy right now. But HUD put out some guidance, the HUD um, COC program, the special needs assistance program, did release guidance um, just last week, I think it was just a few days ago, on the spread of infectious diseases. It was, it started previous to COVID-19, but now they've adapted it for them as specific to outreach and shelters. Um, so I would really consult that guidance and that also has a number of resources in it. Um, you can probably just uh, go to the HUD SNAPS COC program page and look for um, their toolkit on infectious diseases. Thanks, anybody else? All right, well then I'll pass it back to you, Hector. Thank you everybody for the questions and discussion. Yeah, thank you for excellent presentations and uh, for the natural way you guys have uh, answered the questions that come from the audience. Um, again, audience members, for those of you who weren't able to join the full presentations, we'll be uh, sharing this video. Uh, we'll adapt it a little bit to take out extra spaces and stuff, and we'll also share the slides with you, uh, pulling out some slides that may be confidential in terms of publication. Uh, but look out for this uh, sometime by the end of the week. Uh, again, I'd love to give a round of applause to our esteemed faculty for excellent presentation. Um, at Kalahia, we have uh, quick strike consultation opportunities and uh, the esteemed faculty here who are doing the cutting edge research in housing and health um, may be available for consultation. We're, at Kalahia, we actually provide support to faculty to enable them to interact with you all on the policy uh, development side as well as uh, any other scientific consultation needs you may have around this issue. So please connect with Marisa or me if you do have, uh, want some scientific consultation. Um, we can definitely connect you to faculty here, but also across the system. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, everybody stay safe and uh, thank you for the wonderful